Hi, Todd Dunn here on November 30th, 2019. Today's video is a system overview of my battery slash solar power backup system for my house. And what I'm going to do is walk through the individual components that make up the system. I'm going to explain what each component is, why I chose that particular component, and then at the end of the video, we will go through the costs for the individual components and the total cost for the system. And I'll say a few words about how well it's been working. Okay, let's get going. The first part of the uh, solar battery backup power system is the solar array. The solar array I decided to install is a 1020 watt array that's made up of six 170 watt 12 volt solar panels. They're wired together in series so that I can minimize the current that's coming off of the panels uh, while maximizing the voltage and that allows me to use somewhat smaller wires when I wire from the solar panels into the house to where I have the solar charge controller. I opted to use these relatively small panels, which are smaller than you'd usually find in a roof mount solar array, for one reason. And that is that there are no dealers uh, that sell solar panels in this area. I live kind of out in the sticks. And uh, consequently, I would have to have any solar panels that I bought shipped to me. Now the larger panels, say 250 watt panels or 300 watt panels, are too big to ship by UPS. So they would have to come by truck freight. And that would be quite expensive to get those panels delivered to me here. Uh, probably as much or maybe even more than the panels cost. So I opted to go with the smaller panels that could be shipped via UPS. I ended up buying them on Amazon with free shipping, so I had no shipping cost. Yes, the panels were a little bit more expensive per watt than the larger panels would have been, but the difference in shipping cost more than offset that. So that's why I have six 12 volt panels up there on the roof. And as I said, they're wired in series to give me high voltage, relatively low current, and that allows me to use somewhat smaller lead wires. Now the panels aren't just sitting on the roof, they are on an iron ridge roof rack which is lag bolted into the roof joists in uh, six places. And there are two rails attached to the actual mounts. And those two rails are each 14 feet long. And again, I opted to, have, to buy four seven foot rails and tie them together into two 14 foot rails rather than buy the 14 foot rails because the smaller rails could be shipped by UPS rather than by truck freight, which made them less expensive for me, even though the cost for the smaller rails was a little bit higher than for longer rails. And the panels are attached to the rails with uh, special mounting brackets that make the panels and the rails all one system electrically, and that's for grounding. And there is a number six solid copper ground wire attached to the rack which goes down through the roof and into the house and out the back wall of the house to an eight foot ground rod that I drove into the ground. The six panels wired together in series have an open circuit voltage of about 132 to 133 volts. And at maximum power point, the voltage is going to be around 110 volts. But the six panels will only be operating at a maximum of about 9.5 amps. And that allows me, given the length of my run, to use relatively small lead wires. I could have gotten away with number 10 lead wires. But I opted to go up to number 8. And the reason for that is, ultimately, I think I may add an additional thousand watts of solar at some point in the future and I would like to be able to use 
the uh, same lead wires and not have to pull new lead wires through the conduit because that was a real pain. Now that brings up the conduit. I didn't want exposed wires so I ran them in three quarter inch PVC conduit that starts above my roof, penetrates the roof, uh, goes through the edge of the roof, comes down the front of the house, you can see it there at the bottom of the picture next to the door, and goes through my deck. If we move to the next picture, you can see after it comes through the deck it makes a right angle turn and goes across the front of the house for about six feet and then through the outside wall of the house into my garage and from there it goes across my garage and into my utility room where the rest of the system is at the back of the house. This picture shows where the solar lead wires and the ground wire exit the conduit in my utility room. The wires are fed down the wall the lead wires uh, go down to the next group of components and the ground wire goes to a small bus bar that I put in there for a couple of reasons. First off I wanted to have a, a connection point for, for DC system components that need to be grounded. It was a real pain to uh, feed the wire through my uh, utility room uh, because of the presence of various other things in there such as my heating system and all the paraphernalia associated with my well which basically were in the way when it came to feeding that wire out. So I split the wire there and connected it to the bus bar and you can see I've got at this point one other component attached and the bottom wire on the bus bar uh, goes down to the floor and across and out through the back wall of the house to where the ground rod is driven into the ground. Okay, where do the wires go from here? Okay, the solar lead wires continue down uh, to this uh, little electrical box that I've got mounted on the wall and there are two circuit breakers in this box. On the left is my solar disconnect, and yes, I will be putting labels on, I just haven't gotten around to it yet. The solar disconnect is a circuit breaker rated for 150 volts DC and 30 amps. Uh, that gives me enough headroom to add an additional 1000 watts of solar, and also uh, protects the wires that come in because the number eight wires can carry considerably more than 30 amps of power. So that protects the wires. Now after that circuit breaker the positive wire goes to the solar charge controller and the negative wire bypasses circuit breakers and goes directly to the solar charge controller. The other uh, circuit breaker in this box is the battery output from the solar charge controller. The positive wire from the solar charge controller goes to this circuit breaker which is also a DC circuit breaker rated at 65 volts and 40 amps because the maximum power output that I can get from my charge controller is 35 amps and that's wired with number six wire so 35 amps is way below the carrying capacity of number six wire so that's an adequate circuit breaker there. This is the solar charge controller. It's a Victron Smart Solar 150-35 MPPT charge controller. Smart Solar means that it has Bluetooth output and I can log into it with my smartphone and change all the settings and also look at all the data that the charge controller has and it does store a lot of data. So since I have a 1000 watt array, I needed a controller that can handle at least 1000 watts of solar. Also, because I have six 12 volt panels wired together in series, the six panels all together will have an open circuit voltage of around 132 volts and a maximum power point voltage in the 110 volt range. So I needed a controller that can handle 
those voltages and have a little bit of headroom in terms of voltage. So this controller met the input voltage needs and could handle the solar array that I installed. So the output of this controller comes out in positive and negative wires. As I mentioned before, the positive wire goes to a circuit breaker so that I can disconnect it from the batteries and then after that down to the batteries. And the negative wire goes down to a shunt and hence to the batteries. And I'll explain the purpose of the shunt in just a second. Now this picture shows two components. One is the shunt that I just mentioned. And this shunt is the uh, input device for a Victron BMV712 smart battery monitor. And what this does, it's in the, the shunt is located in the main power lead uh, coming out of the battery box and going to the, uh, all of the systems. And that uh, is in the negative line. The shunt is there to send data to the battery monitor so that I can monitor the state of charge of the batteries, which is a very important uh, because I don't want to run my batteries down too far and shorten their life. And, uh, and to the right of the shunt, you can see a battery switch. This is a battery switch rated at 48 volts. And I have opted to go with a 24 volt battery system, nominal voltage. The actual operating voltage for a 24 volt battery system can come in up around 29 volts. So you have to have a switch in the system and it's in the positive wire from the batteries uh, to allow me to disconnect the batteries from my loads. And you need a switch that's rated both for the voltage that you're operating at and for the amperage of the loads. And this particular switch is rated for a continuous load of 275 amps and an intermittent load up to I think 700 amps. So it can handle the current and, and it's also rated for 48 volts DC. As I said, I'm running a 24 volt nominal system so it can handle the voltage. Now this shows my battery bank. Battery bank currently consists of six Group 27 deep cycle flooded 12 volt batteries. They're rated at 105 amp hours and that gives me approximately 7.6 kilowatts of battery storage capacity. And since these are deep cycle batteries, I don't really want to draw them down below 50% uh, very often. So that gives me about 3,800 watts or 3.8 kilowatts of available power for my backup power system. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I've wired this uh, battery bank into a 24 volt system, which means that each pair of uh, batteries are wired together in series and then the three pairs are wired together in parallel. I've taken care to make sure that the leads from each pair of batteries to my parallel connection point is the same so that we don't have differential voltage drops and ultimately I will be adding two additional batteries to bring the uh, battery uh, capacity up to just a bit over 10 kilowatts, which uh, will give me a bit over 5 kilowatts of usable power storage. But I don't have the other two batteries because my battery supplier uh, sold me all the batteries that they had. And I'm waiting for the other two to come in so that I can get the system set up. Now, the wiring within the battery bank is number two. I used ANCOR wire, which because of its high temperature insulation has a higher ampacity rating than wire with lower temperature insulation. And the number two wires have uh, an ampacity rating in excess of 150 amps. And when the system is completed, 
uh, the maximum amperage that we'll be drawing from it is 250 amps from the entire battery bank and with four parallel strings of batteries that means that I'll not be drawing more than about 60 amps from any pair of batteries assuming they're all more or less balanced. And even now with only three pairs of batteries that means I'm only going to draw about 83 amps. So this wiring is adequate for the internal wiring within the battery bank. The wires from the battery bank to my inverter are number 2 slash 0 or 2 aught and they're rated for 310 amps uh, of continuous uh, current and that is more than my maximum current of 250 amps and the maximum current is set by a fuse which is in the positive line which is a 250 amp fuse now it's possible because of the characteristics of fuses that I will have a short duration current uh, above 250 amps although it's not likely because my inverter uh, is not set up to draw more than 250 amps if it, it, when it's in surge mode so I'm pretty safe there in terms of the overall wiring the wires uh, from the uh, battery bank as I've said the negative wire goes to a shunt and then to the inverter and the positive wire goes to a switch and then to the inverter and I've already talked about the shunt and the switch so let's take a look at the inverter this is the inverter that I bought it's probably overkill for my system in that it's a 4000 watt inverter uh, for 24 volt operation it has a 7,000 watt surge capacity, which is plenty of headroom for my systems. And it also has 120, 240 volt split phase output. I had to have 120, 240 volt split phase output because one of the critical systems that we want to be able to run during a power outage is my well pump and it runs on 240 volts. So a standard 120 volt inverter wouldn't work, so I had to get a more expensive split phase output inverter. This is a Schneider Connex SW4024 inverter. As I said, it's probably overkill for my system. I could have gone with a smaller inverter, say a 2500 watt inverter. That would have been adequate for my loads, but I... Uh, the price difference between Schneider's uh, 2524 inverter and their 4024 inverter was four dollars. So I went with the higher capacity inverter. Now this is not just an inverter, it's an inverter charger and you can also connect it to AC input from the grid to run the charger and it has a fast transfer switch so that if you have the inverter in standby mode when it's connected to the grid if the power goes out it's supposed to be able to switch over to inverter power in 20 milliseconds and that should be fast enough that we won't even know that there was a power outage uh, until we notice that the circuits that are not connected to the inverter uh, are dead the output from the inverter goes to a 10 circuit transfer switch and what this transfer switch does is it allows me to run the 10 circuits that I've selected to be connected to the inverter either directly from the grid or if I flip the switches you can see up there on the top of the transfer switch I can select individual circuits to run off of the inverter and when a circuit is switched over to uh, inverter operation it is completely disconnected from the grid the transfer switch acts as a way of isolating this particular circuits from the grid and the reason you want to do that is so that you don't backfeed the grid during a power outage which creates hazards for the power company line workers the transfer switch 
has got a number of circuits on there. I've got my refrigerator, my freezer, my well, my heating system, and a bunch of different lighting circuits in the house connected to it. So basically, uh, if we have a power outage, the inverter's internal fast transfer switch will switch over uh, from grid power to inverter power and the output of the inverter will be fed through this transfer switch to the select circuits so that the inverter output is isolated from the grid. And the output from this transfer switch goes into my electrical panel via the uh, shielded uh, conduit you can see there and it goes into the back of the electrical panel which is on the other side of the wall that the uh, transfer switch is located on and uh, that's basically the system. So how well does the system work? I've tested it a little bit. Uh, I've run my refrigerator for a day on it. That's my biggest draw by far. It draws about 2400 watts a day if I let it run all the time. So that's determined for me that I'm probably going to run the refrigerator during the day of a power outage when the solar panels output should be enough unless it's completely overcast to uh, run the refrigerator without drawing on the battery bank and possibly uh, except maybe in mid-December provide some additional power to recharge the batteries from any operation the night before. The system is sized so that I can, in theory, uh, on the batteries alone, get through about a two-day power outage, uh, either in the winter or in the summer. There are some trade-offs in the winter. I'm going to probably be running the heat. In the summer, I won't. But in the summer, the refrigerator will probably run more than it does in the winter because it's a little cooler. So, two days of standalone power just off the batteries. The solar array, however, in the winter can provide me with somewhere between about one kilowatt per day on average. Uh, in December, up to about four and a half kilowatts a day on average in the summer in July. And four and a half kilowatts a day uh, is more power than I'll use and that allows me to run strictly off solar during a power outage in the daytime and then use the battery bank to get me through the night and the next day the uh, solar will recharge the batteries and allow me to run my systems strictly from solar. So in the summer if we have a power outage, say a hurricane hits us and the power is out for a week, given the size of my battery bank and my solar array and the expected solar input, I should have enough power to run more or less indefinitely. Now let's take a look at the system costs. This table shows the costs for the different major components in the system. I've included everything here, rounded off a little bit, but uh, not too much. And I'm not going to go through these individually. If you want to see what the individual system component costs were, pause the video and you can read them out of the table. But I will summarize it. Basically, my overall cost, including sales tax and all shipping costs, uh, for the full 8 battery system is going to be approximately $5,700 that's a lot of money for a backup power system to get you through power outages of which we have you know three or four a year uh, however because this is a solar electric system on my house it qualifies for the 30 percent federal solar tax credit and that works out to approximately seventeen hundred and ten dollars and when I subtract that off, it leaves me with a net cost of $3,990. And that is uh, still expensive, but a lot better than $5,700. So that's uh, what the system consists of and what it costs. 
Now I did all of the labor myself. If you had hired some of the labor done, the electrical work inside, or perhaps putting the solar panels on the roof, uh, it could have been substantially more expensive. Furthermore, one of the reasons I opted to go with this system is that I could have gone, for example, with a Tesla Powerwall. Uh, one Tesla Powerwall would uh, meet my needs for three to four days uh, in, the, in the summer and probably about two days in the winter and would have been more than adequate. But a fully installed Tesla Powerwall is going to cost about $10,000, so pretty close to twice what this system cost. And that's without any solar. I still would have had to spend another couple thousand dollars to get solar and connect it to the Tesla Powerwall. So maybe $12,000, maybe a little more to get an equivalent system to what I've built here. Now yes, a system based on lithium batteries would last a lot longer than my system based on lead acid batteries, but 99% of the time my batteries are going to be up at float charge so they'll actually last quite a long time. I would expect them to last six to seven years anyway. Unless I, for some reason, decide to start cycling them a lot more. And even then, they're good for two to three years. So there's a big saving doing it the way I did relative to going with a Tesla Powerwall. Not to mention that the Tesla Powerwall has the requirement that it be connected to the Internet. Uh, I'm not really fond of that. Uh, my current system is completely standalone. Uh, the only person who will be aware of what it's doing is me. Anyway, that sums up the system and the costs. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you did, please give me a thumbs up. And if you haven't, uh, please subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to click the notification bell so you'll get an indication of when my next exciting video is ready for you to watch it. Thanks for watching.